Welcome everyone to Virtual MOCA. This is our Thursday NARC programs um, with Damian Ortega. Uh, we, for the month of November, or the month of November so far, have been filming his uh, film, uh, Moby Dick, as part of our screen program, which is actually part of a trilogy of works um, that MOCA owns as part of its permanent collection that um, we are going to talk about today. Uh, just to reintroduce myself, I am Byron Barsana. I am the um, assistant curator and manager of programs here at MOCA. And I wanna thank um, Damian for joining us today. And I wanna thank the San Francisco Foundation California for um, supporting our public programs at MOCA. Um, for the program today, we're gonna screen um, the second video that's part of the, the um, Beatle trilogy named Escarabajo. So we're gonna stream that here and screen share. And then Damian and I are gonna have about a 20, 25 minute conversation. And after that, we're happy to take Q and A. So um, with that, I'm gonna cue in uh, our virtual Mocha host to start the screen share. Damian, I'm not sure if you know that you're muted, so no one can hear you in the. So you want, we might want to unmute yourself. Hi, I will say something briefly about the, the, this movie. It's a silent film. I did it with my own camera from uh, when I was a child, a super eight millimeters uh, film. Um, and it's three minutes each one. Then I, I did um, some road movie, just taking pictures from my home to the uh, factory of Volkswagen cars. Um, when the same year, uh, which was a coincidence, was the same year when, when the, the factory stopped the production of the, the, this car. Uh, we pass first in the first part of the, the film, we pass through um, the, the street, with the main street when, when the crash cars, old cars, second hand ones, and also is a big market of stolen cars um, are for sale. Then this is the road to the Puebla, which is the, the original factory of the Beetle car. And I was driving there with my, uh, my own car.
the title is Escarabajo, is a, a translation of Beetle, but it's also a, a kind of joke with the, or double meaning, like a face down, cara, es cara abajo in Spanish, face down. So this is the road from to Puebla from Mexico City? Yes. So. And then I took these slides or these, these uh, postcards and moving uh, in the, on the road. Whose beetle was this? Whose uh, watcher was it? 83. It was a, it was my um, a sweet story because it was a car of my father and he uh, gave it to me, and it was a uh, interesting. All you will talk about the the Beatle trilogy, because uh, because in in sixties uh, even to the eighties or nineties uh, was a very powerful car uh, for uh, young art, young people, students or people would know so much um, uh, money. And then uh, many stories, everyone, uh, many people came to come to me and asked them, told me stories about the, their own trips and on, the, on the car and how much they, they love the car, the experiences about the, the um, with their own Beatles, no? There is the factory. And I asked them if I can go in, uh, and they say no, uh, they don't permit me the access. And then I keep going to the back side of the factory. If you have chance later, is a, I think in YouTube is still there the, the advertising, the original advertising from the 60s was really brilliant. Uh, and it was a kind of a Western with the, with, the Beetle, with the Beetle car instead the horse. Then it was some cowboys driving the car and jumps in the, in the breaches. And it's a kind of mythological and, and um, um, road a movie like a western and I keep on on mind this this idea uh, finally we found a uh, um, piece of land in front of a house and we asked to the owner if we can <laughs> dig a hole there and uh, also with local people we asked for some help uh, to bury this this uh, big dig a, this dig a, a hole uh, it was interesting because it was a ramp on it for those of us for those of you who who don't who haven't been to mexico and don't know the significance of this car to mexican culture i think that um it's important to know how endemic this car is and how important it is to mexican not autom only automotive culture like you know, I think that here in the United States, we see the bug as like a kind of odd counterculture item, right? That only a few people had, but up until very recently, maybe the last 10 years, these cars were the car of the middle class, the car of that so many people had. Um, and as, as Damian said, you know, everyone has sort of memory of a Bocho or a Beetle. Um, the taxis are Beetles, the, you know, it's the car that sort of everyone had. and it, I guess one of the really interesting things is that, you know, it was meant as like, you know, a Volkswagen, a people's car for everyone. And it sort of achieved that mission more in Mexico than anywhere else where it was really um, sort of, you know, I can't express how many of them I grew up uh, in Mexico really, City. It was yeah. really popular, really, really popular. All the workers, uh, not all, but many workers can have, have one. It was easy to repair to find a solution by yourself and clean it and, and repair the car with a no big budget. Um, was uh, very uh, useful for students. Then the city grew really a lot in the 60s 
And then it was important to have a car. And was in US or Europe was a bit hippie, hipster, the, the, the car. But Mexico was really a popular thing. It, as you say, it's, it was everywhere. And my family has one, uh, my, my aunt, my grand, my uncle, my father, my mother, everyone. Like, um, and then, uh, of course, you create a lot of emotional re relations with your car. In LA, it's very um, amazing, especially how many people, how many hours you spend in the car. Uh, and then I found uh, it was really old. My car was really damaged I, uh, and I cannot uh, repair every week. And then I need to sail, but I thought it was really cruel to sail somebody who, which I have a lot of um, um, affection and some, uh, I really appreciate my car. And I feel it's like a pet in some ways, my dog, when, when you lost your dog and you really feel so, so sad and it's, it's a symbol of your childness and your security, uh, many things happen and, and at that time. And I, have the same feeling with the car and also was a symbol for, for me. I can jump from one thing very rational, like I, I was a symbol of the modernity of the, 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 the dream of the, of the one period and how it was changing uh, with this new technology and becomes obsolete. And uh, I did this, uh, uh, like a funeral with a car as the as the as the beetles or the insects dies used to die which is just uh, flopping like this uh, and dies with the with the uh, legs and the arms uh, up no then uh, it was a little bit also like the uh, bulls fight when at the end is is the the bull goes uh, around the, the the circle of the plaza then uh, we dig the, the, the piece and we, we buried the car. It was a, a strange feeling for me because also I thought it was positive. Like, uh, you know, it's when you see, uh, put a seed into the ground and you uh, expect for a reincarnation or re, re, um, uh, grow again at the plant, you know, a, a big tree or something, a tree of modernity. Uh, modernism. Uh, there's the car. What's up? A, a nice story because the first, uh, when I conceived the three uh, pieces for the trilogy, I didn't have chance to do this film because also I was very worried to lose my car. Then uh, I did it outside of my uh, house, my own house. I just found some, I bought some. Uh, um, wheels, tires of, of the beetle, and I buried only the four, the four wheels without the car. <laughs> and it was a very nice, because it was exactly the same uh, spirit than this one. You, you can identify when, when is the car inside or is not. In some way, people understand it was a um, funeral, but uh, everyone understood it was a joke it was a strange uh, and, and lovely uh, old experience with with the people yeah i think that um not to keep making these sort of analogies but it's it's part of it is like you know um there's a dream in the you know metaphorically like a dream in the beetle right and it's a personal dream of your own to own something in the freedom but also like a in terms of um like a national icon in a way, right? That you are burying, and I think it, it, it's it's it is tender in a way because, um, as you say, you're bringing it back to its sort of like ancestral homeland where it was created, right? It's like kind of like taking like a Mustang back to Detroit or something and saying like this is where, um, yeah. you know, that how, how a national identity can be, you know, put into these sort of machines, um, and I'm I'm just gonna. Sorry, I just want to say that right now we're looking at we're going to see images of the um, all three pieces that are part of the trilogy while we're talking, so we can reference those, or, and you can see sort of like the three pieces that everyone yeah. who's watching can see the three pieces. Just let me tell, tell something quickly about the other one, the, the Scarabajo. Also, I was reading at that time uh, Joseph Campbell about mythology, 
and also like this mythological the, the trip or the uh, road from one uh, hero to the to the uh, destiny and some things like this or like the animals who dies in the same place when when they born burn born mm -hmm. and then I, I did this uh, these pieces um, it was some personal mythology or personal reference very emotional person in in a, a unique um, my own perception but it was interesting how this symbol becomes really important for as a symbol of the modernity of the Mexico, of the transformation. And in some way also like it's what is crazy and is beautiful is the different kind of uh, interpretations because in Germany, they was very different because the Beetle car is a, is a German invention. The origin of the car was designed by Adolf Hitler for a, a colony uh, and invasions of the of the of the different territories and after that they wants to sail for people in a cheap cheap price then uh, of course what's different the, the interpretations no from as a symbol of the freedom as very hipster mm -hmm. german uh, fascism uh, personal mexican symbol then was very rich all the 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 life of this piece no right right yeah, I think that's also this, the one of the really interesting things about the beetle is that it does have it is like a product of an early product of globalization and global manufacturing. You know, this is a 100 percent we associate or, you know, someone who, if you're familiar with Mexico associates, a very Mexican product that's produced in Mexico. But its genesis is, of course, um, a product of, you know, pre-World War Two or you know during World War Two. And um you know, it carries that history in it, but it's been it's been so transformed in the like sort of Mexican consciousness. You know, like I don't think people even think of it as a German car. Yeah, not anymore. No, in some way, it was a very global global c c symbol, as you say. Um, I don't know exactly that. The, I thought in this trilogy also very like a religious or or how um, it's a redemption, it's a death, and then becomes something like an ethereal and, and uh, spiritual and mm, of course it's a capricious and it's, it's a it's a game it's a joke but um all this road to the death finally uh, on on the previous one maybe the first chapter uh, is the one with Moby Dick which I hold the car uh, from the from from the back side and I switch the the tires for um a clean ones for a, a, a smooth one. Stripped, yeah. Yeah, and I put a lot of fat on it uh, and water grease. On the floor, yeah. grease, grease on the on the on the wheels, and of course the the car was uh, slipping, uh, sweeping, sweeping, sweep, slipping. Yeah. Then I hold it. I can hold it. Now in this picture is is myself and some audience. I was I invited some some guitar uh, and, and a band to play a very, very famous song of uh, Led Zeppelin, uh, Moby Dick, uh, which is a beautiful, great solo of drums. Then in the parking lot, three layers down, down was really like a nice uh, sound and the atmosphere was really interesting, like a very echo, echo expanded. The drums was like a boom, 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 boom with a big resonance and uh, but was a very primitive ritual or very primitive uh, cavern uh, experience no I, I wrote something uh, about also how the necessities of uh, cruelness or, or, or hunter becomes part of the visit to the supermarket uh, and it was a, a the first part of the of the trilogy, then the the, the barrier of the car, and the third was cosmic thing, which was more the the, the suspended pieces into the gallery, uh, with all the the pieces of the of the car split into the into the space. Uh, but it was interesting to see the connection, the virtual space in between, to recognize the individuality of this big system. Um, thousands of, of pieces 
uh, design one by one uh, with a beautiful materials, great materials, beautiful design, perfect uh, uh, connections, uh, a perfect dialogue and functional dialogue between one to another. And something which we understand or I understood like uh, it was a something uh, as a unity, it was millions of fragments, millions of different places. And with this system, with this idea of whole hanging all of them was a very interesting how uh, dignified each piece was um, split and divided uh, a big system. Um, and also once again, people was really uh, enjoyful as uh, not professional people from the arts was many uh, father with the son goes to to teach the how the, the motor system what, what how the motor works and and in some way was a very uh, human human uh, experience with with uh, this piece right I should say too that one, this video is still available on Mocha screen if anyone um, after this wants to go and see. And actually the image we're seeing right now, that is of the performance downstairs at uh, Mocha. For those of you who um, know how Mocha is laid out, it's sort of, um, there's two parts of Grand Avenue. There's an upper grand where sort of like the Broad stages and Disney concert hall and all that. And then underneath it is this sort of, um, I don't know how to explain it, like dark corridor where uh, funny enough, every single car commercial in America is filmed in that stretch. Every single, like, you know, once you see it once you will see it in every single car commercial. Um, and that's where the performance of Moby Dick was done um, when the film was screened at Red Cat and the, the, the piece was shown at Mocha. And this third piece Moby Dick was um, a performance that was done downstairs at, at um, Mocha's lower grand area. Um, one thing I wanted to ask is about the title Moby Dick, which is of course the, the name of this um, Led Zeppelin piece that was played, but also of course you can't like, you know, Moby Dick conjures of course the white whale and, and the idea that there's like this great conqueror, that, you know, conquering some sort of animal that has to happen. And of course that's happening in their performance in a way, but I'm wondering if you can talk about that sort of like anthropomorphizing of the vehicle a little bit more in the context of the title. It's like this, it's a kind of caricature or paradoxical thing, a paradox of um, how uh, mythology or big uh, challenges or um, primitive instincts became part of the domestic life of everyday life and it was the this big whale which can uh, eat you every morning and bring you to another part of the sea which or the city you no know? like uh, open the mouth and and send you through your your to the new land to the land to to uh, as the as the as the jonas and the whale or 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 like a e ahab the captain uh, try to control the nature of the uh, the power of the nature, but in a very domestic, uh, silly way, uh, an anti-hero uh, uh, history or, or joke. No, in some yeah. way, was a cartoon or a comic strip in, in some way. Um, I want to pivot now to you know this is a work that you made more than almost 20 years ago now. Uh, but I wanna talk about some of the work you're doing now. Um, you know, For those of you that are following MOCA public programs, we've had a really big interest in public art right now because the museum, because the COVID pandemic is closed to visitors, um, at least it's interior spaces. So we've been having a lot of discussions around public art, around public space, about what is available to people. And you are currently embarked in a project of public space in New York called Titan that you organize. And I'm wondering if you can tell us a little about that and we'll drop the link in the chat so you, um, those of you that are watching can see what we're talking about. What's a, a, a new project? And thank you for asking me because uh, I, this piece becomes really like a known. I like it and I still love it, the, the, all the complete uh, logic and the, the life of this piece. But uh, this was, as you say, a few years ago. Um, the new thing 
is uh, I went in the gallery, my gallery from Mexico City is Kurimansuto, and they opened a new space in New York. And uh, I thought it would be interesting to do something, um, to propose something for to them. And uh, I talked with uh, my colleague, uh, Bree Zucker, is a young curator. And we plan something to use the space, uh, the city, as the not get reduced to the gallery, some small place uh, in, in the big city or in this in, in, uh, huge place or huge city like New York. And um, use the energy, uh, understand the systems of communication, distribution, production, and propose something with this energy to use them no, or to, to play with uh, and not go against or no, or no hide our, uh, where we was. And then we start months ago and during the, we decide to do it in the uh, cabins, uh, telephone cabins, like a- Payphone cabins, yeah. Titan cabins, which was really obsolete, but still this analog or very old fashioned um, poster vitrines uh, sometimes in each corner then it was a beautiful a great uh, uh, context to show the pieces and in this in the middle of this uh, uh, logic uh, the covid uh, comes and then we we just say we say let's keep going because we'll be uh, right the perfect timing to do it and then was a kind of coincidence um, and the timing was really um, the best situation for, for, for us and for the project because really the people can walk out, outside with their own protection, breathing fresh air and uh, be out of the houses. It was very stressful for many people to be at home so much time. And then it was a private visit walking in the streets and, be, and see all these uh, uh, posters, this inform this uh, art art pieces, three images for each artist, twelve artists in the in all the all the in the Sixth Avenue, from the sixty two Street to the fifty seven, and uh, the collection of artists, the group of artists was really amazing, very generous, was ex was very uh, like um, exciting, because we call them amazing legendary artists and contemporary. Uh, very powerful and uh, we asked for a, an image they sent by, by email the the information in a digital we sent to the company to print the the posters and one night we went they opened the the, the vitrines we put the posters at three in the morning it was rainy it was very dramatic and very exciting and we put all the in like a 15 minutes we changed the, the complete street with all these image, these posters and the opening was really exciting. A beautiful day, sunny day. Uh, the street was a, a little bit empty and people visit, we, we send invitations to everyone as a, to, to join us for uh, these three months. We'll be install the, the, the exhibition and it was like a really friendly, a very unique um, ex exhibition very lucky and very generous some of the artists like patty smith uh, he she said like um, she wants to to give a message and sing a song and in the corner of her uh, booth she sing a song with the lenny lenny the the, the guitar guitar uh, player uh, and it was like a fabulous to see in the streets, just them singing a, a, a song. And uh, in the other side, uh, Brian, Brian um, uh, um, this, uh, I forget, just one second. Uh, Yvonne Rainer, sorry. Yvonne, Yvonne Rainer, Rainer uh, this uh, amazing uh, choreographer, she, she did, um, performance with the company of that choreography. And in the corner of 53, uh, 
she danced a beautiful piece, not herself because she, she's an, a, a, a major people, major person, like a, a bit elderly old. person, yeah. And then she she organized the crew, and and they did a beautiful a beautiful place. I think I think we can make the contact or, or invite the people to do the link into into this into the uh, Kurimansuto site. Yeah. And you can see the choreography, it's so beautiful. Right, yeah, I, I mean, the names that are associated with this project are incredible. I think you got, I mean, I'm just gonna read them off. Jimmy Durham, Yvonne Rayner, Richard Tierveni, Patty Smith, Minerva Cuevas, Glenn Ligon, Hal Fisher, Ann Collier, Renee Green, Sildo Merelis, Hans Hock, and Zoe Leonard. I mean, these are major, major contemporary artists. I mean, and like living legends, really, like Sildo Merelis is incredible. Yeah. Um, and just to be clear, uh, we're talking, it, it's uh, on 6th Avenue between 57th and 51st, Six. right, on those corners. And um, when did you say it's already down or is it still up? It's still up. will be until um, January, will be, will be finished. I think on, on the 15th will be done. But um, it was very generous. People, we need to understand was the pre-elections in US, people was really excited about to participate, to them to give some uh, courage and to encourage people to participate, to vote, to, 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 to say, and, to, and also after COVID, people really needs, the artist needs to, to say something, to express something. And then also to understand maybe the world will be changed we need a change and it will, will be interesting to find new alternatives to exhibit, to understand the public space, to, and to find a new place for art. Then it was really a, a spontaneous and rich and, and generous, the, the participation. As you say, it's very legendary, like, like the Sildo Mireles and, and Hans Hacke, for example. No? Yeah, but of course, new, new young, younger artists also. Do you see this as like being a way forward in your practice too? Because I mean, you are um, as sort of like inviting others to do things or working as sort of like a facilitator for for these kind of projects. Do you see a future for yourself in that? Do you want to be a curator, huh? uh, Damian? <laughs> <laughs> no, my God, please, no. <laughs> no, 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 but I, I love, uh, I like very much uh, to see art, I like some, um, and I always try to do to do what I feel in my intuition and to participate in projects which I want to to see. Then I uh, I work two or three times curating exhibitions, and I also have um, an editorial house. I publish uh, many interesting books, very seminal uh, text, um, like um, never translated to Spanish. Um, it's really amazing how uh, 10, more than 10 years ago I started because my English is terrible. It was much worse. <laughs> and uh, I started translating the books which I like it and to, to read by myself, but also to share and to create some a context for my own work to involve or to invite other people because I, when I was a young student, I never have a, this kind of literature. I went to the bookstores and I never found, and in some way it was only for, for the people, wealth, wealth people who have chance to visit Europe, to fly to Europe and come back with the new books and also US. And then it was interesting because it was the process of changing for internet, but it, this time was difficult and it was very analog. You have your book and you make photocopies for your friends and you share information. It was kind of, now sounds like a prehistorical thing, but it was the way of doing. And um, I decided to do my own uh, editorial house. I invite friends to translate some, some chapters of the books and uh, it's very, exciting some amazing books of like um, Dan Graham, uh, Sildo Mireles, uh, 
David Medalla, David Hammonds, eh, Robert Smithson, eh, Eva Hess, many, many books who was never translated. And then it was really open a new window for uh, a new universe for all the students and also collectors also to create a community, you know, like um, it was not commercial and then they don't, they, they don't, ex don't exist. Then right. we recognize it's a some small uh, group of people who will love it. And now the, the, these people is much more than, than in the beginning. Then it's really exciting to, to bring a new artist in our context and it's such a, a powerful writings and uh, the reaction is really uh, exciting. Then I like, going back to the question, I like the idea of um, doing, I think we, we grow in Mexico with any, um, uh, how can I say, like a industry. We don't have galleries, we don't have magazines, we don't have uh, books, uh, editorial houses. And also the museums was in, a, in, the, in another generation. Then we was really involved as a critics, as a producers, as a writers, as a, um, uh, editorials, editors, and also artists, but it's part of the create our own context. Then I think it's, it's exciting and it's still the same now with, the, with Titan. Right. Yeah, I think it's really interesting to think about it because it, it's it's a period of art history, right? That um, I think people are really starting to have a lot of interest in is Mexico City during the late 90s and early 2000s, or you know, during the 90s and 2000s was such a collaborative sort of like hotbed of new sculptural practice, new photography, you know, uh, uh, the Taller de los Viernes with Gabriel Orozco and Gabriel Curi and yourself and Minerva Cuevas and all these people and Abraham Cruz Villegas, like people are starting to think of that as like something that was really happening in the 90s and early 2000s as like a very collaborative and important moment in Mexican art history, right? Um, and I think there's a show to be had there. I think there's, there's, it's time for someone to rewrite that history or to make it into an exhibition. But um, that is to say that your practice has always been sort of collaborative and it would, uh, there were so many artists working together at that time from which you came out of, you know? You're, yeah. you're a little bit younger than that generation, but I think. No, I don't think so. <laughs> <laughs> I don't think so. I was born in 67. I'm a bit older. Oh yeah, you are, you're, yeah, you're there, you're there. Yeah. <laughs> All right, um, well, I wanna, um, just say once again how amazing it is and how lucky we are at MOCA to have these three pieces in our collection. I mean, it's um, not only because the performance was done and the film was filmed um, here at MOCA and we're, you know, thank you Alma for, Alma Ruiz for bringing it in when she did, um, but uh, it's just an incredible work and we're so lucky to have it. And thank you Damian for, for joining us and adding to the, you know, list of the information that we have about um about the piece and this you know this conversation lives as we do with all works in our collection is we trying to build up more and more bodies of information and knowledge and history around them so when people in the future who are not damian and i come and want to know something about this piece they'll see this weird zoom panel presentation thing in a hundred years and be like there's a little bit more information there than, uh, <laughs> than in the folder so thank you again uh, I think we have one question. Let me see. Uh, it said one person just to answer this question. Pablo Ruiz says, "Did you leave your car there?" In the, you know what? It was a, a crazy story because um, I did it. I did the, the place. It was there, and I um, saw some guys like a. <laughs> they was planning immediately to take the car <laughs> out, and I say, "Oh, will be a nightmare uh, after." two months to see the car is uh, uh, running into the, who knows. And uh, we need to uh, take it out. And, and it was lovely, amazing, because we put back the car into the wheels. And uh, I did hit the, the ceiling. 
mm -hmm. because it was like this. Then I hit to, to open it again, space, and I turn on the car and it works. <laughs> <laughs> it's kind of this sounds like a I don't know if you've ever seen the film Pet Cemetery where they kill the pets and then bury them again and then they come back like zombies. You want to be careful, like you know that the, that the car doesn't come back as a zombie. It's a uh, a kind and of then wild. I drive the car. I drive the car to my studio and I leave it there for years. All right. Okay. Thank you so much, I mean <laughs> Thank you to everyone who was watching. We really appreciate it. And um, we hope to bring you another screen in um, December will be Day Without Art, um, Visual Aids Day Without Art pro content. And then in January, we'll pick up again with other content. Um, but thank you all for joining it. And thank you, Damian. And thank you, Brian Dang, for um, hosting thank the you. Zoom. Bye-bye, everyone.